Tylius Troubles, Part 54 Nobili Immortale Sequel to the Battle for Ebino Ebino, Winter, 2402-3 Bigino could remember almost nothing but dreams, spilling one after the other for what seemed like years on end. Somehow, his life had flipped, turning the waking world into a distant half-memory, while his sleeping sojourns were both experienced and recalled in great and lengthy detail. Nearly all his dreams consisted of two particular kinds. The first kind were the old recurring nightmares, unfolding as they always had done, to reveal or foretell the horrors of the world, but lasting longer than ever before. And when he might expect to awake, more often than not, they simply spilled from one form to another, as if he were journeying through an entire realm of nightmares, leaving one only to arrive in the next. The second kind, the painful ones, were claustrophobic affairs, in which he could barely move, if indeed at all. There were bars and chains about him, despite the fact he felt so feeble that he could not have escaped from a paper chain in a silken tent. In these dreams, his body ached to every extremity. His skin itched and prickled all over, and he felt hunger that went beyond the mere want of food to want of everything, from air to water, from movement to company. He could sense the fat falling from his bones, as his body seemed to consume itself from within. His every muscle was perpetually tensed, while his mouth remained locked in a grimacing frown, with a steadily growing pressure within his jawbone. Bigino was dreaming now. It was one of his recurring nightmares, in which he was surrounded by the living dead, trapped deep within their realm. There was no escape, nor could he hide, so there was no relief either. This time, however, it was not a nightmare. Not because he was aware he was dreaming, but simply because it was no longer terrifying. In every other sense, the dream was the same. Foul hands were laid upon him, their rotten, worm-ridden flesh touching his own, dead eyes somehow peering at him from dark orbits, the screams of a dying man mingled with the gurgling groans of the undead, his mouth filling with hot blood. All this happened, and more, until the hands touching him were doing as he himself had instructed, while the pus-filled eyes were those of attentive, obedient servants, awaiting his further command. The dying man had perished even as Biagino tore the flesh from his throat with a bite. Rather than gagging on the blood, however, Biagino gulped it down hungrily, like a starving man given warm broth. It was the same dream in every particular, except that he was not the same man. Then something new happened, which had never before been a part of the dream. Someone spoke to him, and it was the voice of a goddess. Ah, sweet priest, she said, you have awoken from your slumber. I see you have already breakfasted. You must have been so very hungry. Biagino forgot his musings concerning the dream, even that it was a dream, and so failed to notice that it was now continuing longer than it had ever done before. Distracted, he gently pushed a cold hand away that had been placing a stole around his neck, then turned away from his meal, allowing his prey to fall to the ground and disappear. Had the man ever been there? He looked at the speaker. It was the Duchess Maria, more beautiful than he had ever seen, her flesh as pale as possible, her eyes alight with delightfully playful malice. He smiled, for it filled him with pleasure to look upon her. He remembered the other times he had been in her presence, the memories came flooding back, each one parting to reveal another. As a novice attending the lecture of Miragliano during Lady Annabella's wedding, when the Duchess was a maid of honour, during his first and second visits to the Abenan court upon the lector's business, and in Viadaza when he and Father Gonzalvo had obtained an audience to petition her support for the crusade. The Duchess strode directly over to him, reaching out as she did so, revealing a serpent entwined about her arm. When she reached him, she stroked his cheek, and he could feel the flickering, licking tongue of the coiled serpent. Rather than the surprise he should have felt at the intimate proximity of a snake, and such strange familiarity from a noblewoman towards a lowly priest, instead he suddenly remembered what was happening. I, I forgot this was a dream, he said, laughing. This is no dream, sweet priest, explained the Duchess. You are awake. 
Indeed, close to being more so now than you have ever been. As she spoke, one of the shambling servants handed Biagino a crozier, headed with a crook of solid gold, then staggered back with a gurgling groan. Upon clutching the staff, Biagino was surprised at how light it was, until realisation dawned, and he found himself instead surprised at his own strength. Lastly, he wondered why he had been given it. The Duchess had now laid her hand upon his chest, and he could feel the tips of her exquisitely sharp nails. She held his eye, as if to read his thoughts. "'The pretty stick is yours,' she said, "'for you are made high priest today to rule over our church.' Biagino grinned. "'Usually my dreams are true, even the strange ones.' The Duchess's hand slid up fast to grab him by the chin, her nails piercing his flesh as she clutched tightly, while the serpent slithered around his neck to lick at his other cheek. Barely feeling any pain, Biagino was duly reassured that this must be a dream. "'You are not listening, dear priest,' whispered the Duchess as her mouth closed upon his ear, her breath cold. "'This is no dream. It is more who sleeps, not us. You need never do so again.' unless you choose it. The first part of what she said made sense to be Aguino. Moore was the god of dreams, and so also the god of the dead, those who had begun their long and final slumber. But the second part meant little to him. The living pray to Moore for help, the Duchess continued, and he answers them in their dreams. There he can frolic and strut in their make-believe worlds, yet they foolishly think him powerful in the waking world too. In this they are wrong, for he never wakes, and he yearns only to usher all others into his eternal sleep. A slug bed and a sleepy head, yet greedy and never satisfied. Bigino was surprised, for instead of being offended at such blasphemy, it all seemed to make sense, and indeed somehow he had always known. The Duchess, still clutching his chin, turned his head from one side to the other, as if to admire it. When he felt movement upon his head, as a consequence... He realised that a hat of crimson cloth had been placed there earlier, probably when he had been lost in fearful reverie. Suddenly, the Duchess yanked his face to hers and kissed him. Her lips were cold and his lips were no warmer. When she released him, she took a step away, her pet snake recoiling itself about her arm. "'We refuse to join Moore's idle slumber,' she said. "'We will not allow ourselves to be imprisoned in his oneric realm.' to have him lord it over us, to prance and dance the giddy fool through an eternal night. We choose instead not to live, yet never to die. We can rest, but we need never sleep. And we serve a master greater by far, not merely born a god, but who made himself one through cunning and the force of his irresistible will. We? asked Biagino, despite feeling that the word was indeed somehow right. Nobili immortale. Governanti della notte, said the Duchess, her head held high. Succhiatori di sangue. She smiled and licked some of his blood from her fingertips. Vampiri. She gestured to his blood-smeared chin, and Biagino wiped it clean with the sleeve of his red robe. He felt no pity for the man he had killed, only satiety. He let his tongue run over his razor-sharp fangs. In place of hunger, fear and pain, he felt only strength. And in that moment, at long last, he awoke. He knew what he was. The Duchess gestured and the servants fell back a little way, lurching ungainly as they did so. Biagino watched without really seeing, for his mind was racing as true understanding flooded into him, gifting a gleefully wicked joy. The urge to laugh was overwhelming, but instead he was surprised to find himself giving vent to a snarling hiss. The Duchess smiled, almost coyly, then curtsied. Your Holiness, she addressed him, High Priest of the ever-living God Nagash. <laughs>